May our Lord be magnified. You may be seated. staying with us. Um, I'm Paul Steinblock. I love what Peter said. I get to serve on the missions committee here. If you know anything about sending churches and the difference between a parachurch ministry where a missions agency sends out missionaries versus a church like Southside who directly sends out, loves and supports its missionaries, this is so much better because I've done both. So it's uh, great to uh, see you guys here. Thank you for coming. Thank you for sticking with us this late. Um, we're going to have a Q&A session. Um, we're going to start with a couple of questions for our panel. Uh, what I would like to do is just have each of you quickly introduce yourself, who you are and uh, what you're doing and what you're going to be sharing with us. And I know, Nick, uh, I just wanted to say, man, words grow with you. Really use me. That, what a praise. That was blessed, blessed, thank you. Thank you, Paul. Is that working? Can you guys hear me? Yeah. As, you, as you heard, my name is Nick Deckard, and uh, we were sent out to Tijuana, Mexico. My name is Ryan Gold. I'm a pastor locally in Highlands Ranch, and I'll be preaching tomorrow on why ecclesiology affects missiology. My name is Ken Murphy, and I'm going to be preaching on Sunday on the Great Commission from Luke 24. My name is Peter Fan, and you've been he hearing me way too much, but um, I, you have to be subjected to me a little bit more Sunday morning during the uh, Sunday school class. I'll be speaking on the commissioned church. Thank you, guys. So we're going to start out with uh, a question that's already been shared with uh, each of the panel members. So they can, uh, they had a chance to think about this. Um, one of the things that uh, we've all experienced in coming through uh, COVID, uh, the isolation that we've undergone, being separated from our communities, how do you guys maintain your relationship and your walk with the Lord when you're separated from your community? Yeah, um, well, we can speak to this in two contexts. Obviously, living in Mexico, um, I want to say first, when we moved there, we were immediately blessed, and this is just God's provision, to have met a faithful family in the Cranes and then also in the Sapus. Um, and, uh, and so we're so grateful for that because we do need the body, and that's, um, we became keen, keenly aware of that immediately after moving there. So we just praise God that we had that community. But on a personal level, uh, much of what I just shared um, Reminding ourselves of the gospel is so important and not losing sight of the gospel. I read that Colossians 1, 5 through 6 text and, and it just it's so true that the gospel, we, we are constantly bearing fruit and increasing in the gospel that we can never outgrow it. We just can't. And so when we get alone with the Lord and when we seek him in his word and in prayer, let it be unto the goal of seeing Christ um, and, and get to that end always. Um, I think it was Robert who encouraged me, you know, you're mining for gold and you keep mining until you find that gold, which is Christ. And so um, that's, that's where we have to rest, is in the pure and simple devotion to Christ. That's where we uh, have, have sought to, to rest as a, as a family, personally, in my, in my walk with the Lord. I heard someone say um, within the last few days something that's just been um, something true in my entire life. When you're in ministry, uh, you really cannot ever neglect your own soul, or you cannot, out of the overflow of your walk with the Lord, minister to others. So for me, it's really no different in COVID um, with communing with the Lord than when there was no COVID. I, I have to be communing with the Lord, reading his word slowly, meditatively, um, Praying extensively, reading 
as widely as I can to refresh my soul. So anytime in ministry I've not done that, I dry up like Colorado grass in August without water. I just cannot, cannot preach, minister, um, lead myself or my family without communing with the Lord. So for me, it's just been a staple by the grace of God since I was 13 years old. Um, and it's just the sweetness of that time I, I refuse to compromise. You're there. Because it sounded like what you're saying is that your personal devotion life is critical when you're separated from your community. Um, is that all we need? Is that core personal devotional life uh, to sustain us? Or how, um, could you just draw the comparison between when you can access your community? Um, what is your response to the ability to go back to church to be with God's people? Oh, I think it's absolutely essential. That's like one of my greater burdens for South Denver. I'm, I'm uh, been a pastor for 14 and a half years in a very affluent area. Um, and I think there's a lot of Christendom in Highlands Ranch and Lone Tree and Castle Pines. I think there's a lack of a first love devotion that has a has an expression in the body connected with the local church and I think without that um, you become very dangerous um, and that could a whole lot to be said about that but you need the body of Christ so badly um, not just for accountability um, there's so many things I could say about I just think it's absolutely essential and one of the greater burdens of my pastoral ministry to help people see. That's why I'm big on church membership. And when we're away from the body of Christ, we absolutely dry up. We get stuck in our own heads and we get dangerously pharisaical without knowing it. It's super dangerous. You need the local church. It always comes back to membership. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> well, the next question will end up in membership. <laughs> Paul, if I'm understanding the question is, is part of it is we're looking at missions and to go out to do missions it's overwhelming when you finally realize I don't have other elders and pastors I don't even have much of a community and I have to keep my soul alive now and so for me at this conference as we're all praying about our areas of missions and how God will use us. I, I don't think anything's more important right now in, in assessing the call, am I going, am I going to my neighbors, is I have to keep my soul alive. I, I remember when I, uh, when we planted Southside Bible Church and um, there's about 70 of us going out to plant it and a, a a dear friend of mine said, you're probably going to, you know, most of the people are going to dry up and die. <laughs> I was like, thank you for the encouragement. <laughs> and it hit me, you know, my wife, I've always wanted to nurture her soul, but all of a sudden I'm, I'm also her pastor. And my kids, who I love, I'm now their pastor. And it starts to hit you that all these people you need to keep your soul alive. Because what everyone's saying, without a soul that's growing and alive in Christ, um, you can't shepherd the flock of God. And so as you're looking at missions, everything I'm hearing from everyone who goes out, I'm sure Nick would tell us this, the hardest thing is now it's you have to keep your soul alive without a lot of the means of grace that you've had your whole journey. So... It's important right now that you're learning how to commune with God and keep your soul alive and, and not drying up. And so if you're going to go serve in this way, nothing's more important than the secret place and that, that you know how to seek God's face and stay, a, a, you know, keep yourself in the love of Christ to minister. And so that would be my exhortation for all of us from this conferences, I need to be one who can grow in Christ with no other means but my Bible and the Holy Spirit and Him.
and that, that'll be an important piece. Follow-up question for you, Ken. So it sounds like I have a lot to do in that. Um, how would you balance that against a verse like Philippians 1, 6 that says, for he who began a good work in you will be faithful to complete it until the day of Christ Jesus. Yeah. To be on the field, to, to experience that dryness, to come to the end of yourself is a very, um, Nick called it dying. Uh, you literally die to yourself repeatedly um, many times. And um, I'll, I'll let you speak to it, but I'm just thinking about, you know, crying out and relying upon God and his grace. Amen. So I would see Philippians 1, 6, that he who began work in you will be faithful to complete it. And he's going to use dry times. He's going he's gonna to bring you to the end of your own sufficiency and your own abilities. And so the, I'd say that the balance is, is I'm seeking to keep my heart in communion with God. And, and as you said, if I drift at all, I dry up. And God will teach you lessons in fullness, and he'll teach you lessons in dryness. I can't take another step and the hardness of ministry. He, he will use all of that to finish the work that he's doing. So it, mountaintops are not the main way he sanctifies us. And he will use all these other things. Amen. Thank you. And following up on that, I would have to agree that um, it's in those valleys, it's in those hard, dry times that um, we realize how close God always is and just how precious the body of believers is for encouragement. I, you, you mentioned COVID and I, working at the hospitals, going through COVID, I was mercifully spared. I remember, for example, having to go in the OR, operating on the windpipe of a patient with COVID, spewing virus through the air and you know, wearing all the protective gear that I could and you know, God protected me never got sick, never tested positive. What a mercy. And then, after most of the pandemic has waned away, I got slammed with COVID. I got so horrendously sick, and it was hot on the heels of my car accident, and it became this immensely dry time. So I went from always being able to go to work, because I'm an essential healthcare worker, blah, 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 and always being around people, to all of a sudden being very isolated, but spiritually, also going through this dry period where I had allowed myself to not avail myself of the means of grace. You know, Pastor Gold talked about how he sensed it's essential that he take that time for personal quiet time and worship, otherwise he's dry and has nothing to give. And I did not avail myself of that. And I dried up, I got weak, I got bitter, and I wasn't with the body. And it was when God humbled me and then reconnected me with the body and reconnected me with himself, that I had something to say. Finally, he spoke through me and I was grateful for that, but it took that dry time. So never take for granted or forsake the body because if you have that opportunity, seize it, plug in, lock shields, be with the body. Thank you. One, one thing to add on is sure. when Peter came back after that, he taught Sunday school, and when he was done, I was just trembling and said, you're, you need to speak that at this conference. And so what, what you're going to hear on Sunday morning has came out of that place. And I, I think your hearts are going to be greatly encouraged by Sunday morning. Thank you. Before we move on to the second question that uh, the gentleman had a chance to review, um, if any of you have questions, we definitely want to give you time uh, to ask them. Taylor has a mic in the back, so just raise your hand, and uh, we'll, um, we'll start taking questions from the audience here in a few minutes, so be thinking about what you would ask. Um, our next question is a um, lot of uh, cultural division, a lot of anger, um, a lack of kindness. There's even a be kind movement in response to that, um, political division, um, uproar within the culture, um, what, what are your impressions of that? How do we interpret that as we observe that? Are we in the end times? Is this Revelation straight out of the book? Is this Romans? At the end, there'll be lovers of money, lovers of self. I mean, I look at that, and I'm, I'm just terrified. What if this is it? How, what do I think? What do I do? 
Um, how do we? How do I get my folks through this? Yeah, um, I wish I could piggyback on some of what these guys are going to say because I'm sure it'll be great. Um, but I will say, uh, Colossians four comes to mind. You said we we went through the book of Colossians as a church and um, and just being reminded that we are called to be wise toward outsiders, right? Yeah. And um, and it says to to uh, <laughs> I have it in Spanish to aprovechar el tiempo. <laughs> it's to uh, take advantage of the time um, before us. And um, and the word there is is is, uh, is curios, right? Is it curios? Kairos, kairos, um, which is which is the not chronological, but the appointed time. It's the appointed time, and so um, the appointed time is now, right? And uh, and the call there, the command there, is that our speech would be gracious and seasoned with salt. Mm -hmm. And so we want to um, we want to model the gospel to this world. And so my flesh, I'm going to speak personally. My flesh is tempted toward um, that vindictive spirit see in the culture raging on. Um, and I think that's probably the temptation for most. I'm not going to speak for all, but I think that's a temptation for a lot of people is, is we're more tempted toward that kind of vindictive um, approach to things than the passive, you know, uninvolved approach. Like we, we want to see vindication happen. And, um, and you see that happening in the political current of the climate that we're in. And, um, and so uh, I, my, the appeal that I have, I, I have to pray this, and this was my appeal as well, is, is, man, what happened to grieving for the image bearers of this world who are just lost? And so um, learning to replace, I think, potentially the anger, the animosity, kind of that vindictive spirit with grief for those people, I think, is so key in my own personal life. Um, grief that, that they are missing out so much of what we are, are tasting and seeing and experiencing as believers. Um, but within that, we have to look at Christ and look at his life. And obviously, Christ modeled that very well for us. I mentioned Matthew 9, looking out on the people like sheep without a shepherd. But he was also very bold. I mean, you have other examples of him going in the temple and being very, uh, you know, clear um, with the people in that time. And, um, his, that, that righteous anger, we often call it. Um, and we don't want to be the church of Thyatira that just kind of tolerates the world and this, some of this be kind movement that we, we hear about all, all over the place. And so we do want to be um, salt and light in this world. And so that, there's, a, there's a, a really fine balance. Um, I'm probably more prone to fall on the, the side of, of the, the like vindication is mine instead of vindication being the Lord, the Lord's. Um, but I think there's probably a balance the other side too, that we want to be faithful to proclaim the full counsel of God and not compromise. And that might be a real temptation as well, so. Could you, yeah, no, go ahead and pass it. But just could you deal with what Nick said about being salt and light? I have a family to support. Um, if I openly share the gospel, I'm gonna get canned and have to go do something else? I mean, is that a legitimate response to our cultural mandate, uh, or the biblical mandate to share the gospel? Um, you know, how do you balance those things? Because we all feel guilt almost on a daily basis over these, what we know to be true, how we fail to step up so many times. Um, you know, it's gonna cost me everything. Where is that balance? The layers to this um, question are Profound. I, I, I love studying culture. I, um, one thing I'm noticing with this whole thing, I love reading widely. Uh, Douglas Murray is a conservative intellectual. The conservative movement's really changing right now and losing its mores. He's gay, but he's conservative. And he, write, he wrote um, The Madness of Crowds. I read that. And then I currently am working through War on the West. And it's talking about this collapse trying to read Victor David, David Hansen's book on the, the fading American citizen. Um, and what I'm noticing with conservatives and the anger and the fear is um, the solution is to the foundations, but it's often uh, with the fruit of bitterness and self-righteousness. So example, Douglas Murray in his book on War on the West 
one of his conclusions at the end, I kind of peeked, I haven't read this yet, is gratitude. How fascinating for a gay, unsaved conservative, all those are, seem to be oxymorons, but this is a new world we're living in, to say the conclusion is gratitude, but gratitude without God is not going to reach anybody. It's not supernatural. And I think what God is calling us to, I share with Nick, if I was unsaved, I would be a steaming hot, angry, conservative uh, political activist if I didn't know Christ. I'm not because my hope is in the Lord, and no matter what happens with the craziness of what's going on, from Biden's speech with the red background, the Marines, and saying, if you voted for Trump, you're a very dangerous person, that's half of our American population, and a lot of the church, what are we to do in times like this? We're to hope in God. We're to not fear being canceled. We're to speak the gospel boldly, and we have this modeled throughout the scriptures. I mean, I just think of Daniel, who I read about the other day. They said, we hate you. You've had a lot of favor. So we're going to make this law and manipulate the king to make a law so that we can basically can you. He prays four times a day, gets thrown in the pit of lions. The king's in angst because he's bound by his own legality, and God preserves him and we all speak about it, and from Sunday school songs to it's a, it's a great uh, tonic to our fear-ridden souls ourselves. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego bow down or get thrown in the furnace. Somebody's in the furnace with them. As this brother was just speaking in Iraq, that's what the Lord's speaking to me lately. Matthew 28, 20. The gospel of Matthew begins with Emmanuel, Christmas, and ends with the same message. Emmanuel's God with us. What does Jesus say in the last verse? I am with you always to the end of the age. That ought to make us fearless, knowing our God owns the cattle on a thousand hills. We can be gospel bold preachers. I have seven kids. I preach, uh, I pastor a very small church. Um, I think of these very same things. I'm not to fear. My God is the sovereign over every world leader, as we'll look at tomorrow morning, and over everything that's going on right now. And he's ordaining even all the trans, authoritarian, totalitarian persecution that's coming to awaken the church. So I know who goes before me. I know who stands behind. The God of angel armies is always by my side. Testing. Um, I think what, what I saw in a lot of the meetings I had, evangelism, is America is, you know, the three things are the conservatives, are our family, God, and country. And if you get them out of order, two become an idol. And when all this started breaking, they, they all three were on the same plane. And I started watching the anger growing when all of a sudden country wasn't what it's always been for us and how we've known it and the things I grew up and it was very disheartening and and then with the families and all they're all dividing up over the different issues and so that was where I really felt the anger started growing and and you know it just it, it continues to this day and so I to me it's what Ryan said is God has to be Supreme, and I don't feel bitter. I don't feel angry. Um, I think we are. Un it's unfolding, and what an opportunity! People are finally listening. People are finally desperate. Mighty things are happening in America, and so I love Romans two four that it's your kindness that leads us to repentance. And if we will enter into what is going on in this society and country at peace and kindness proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ, we're going to see mighty things happen. And so I think with us, we're not angry because God is supreme and country, all that points to is that we have a better country. And some of you are starting to realize America is not your hope. 
but my citizenship's in heaven, and that's why I'm not shaken. And we have an opportunity now to show where our true citizenship is and to model it and, and to not get lost in lesser things. And Ryan wanted to say one more thing. Membership? <laughs> I know he loves me. He's my pastor. Um, I would say less Tim Keller, more Richard Wormbrandt. I think, um, again, I love to watch what's going on. The conversations within evangelicalism right now are absolutely fascinating. Fascinating. And I think we need to lean into the men who have been through what we're about to go through. Richard Wormbrandt, who started Voice of the Martyrs. And um, this is all, I, I like Keller, I like what he's contributed to the church, but I think it's less Tim Keller and more Richard Wormbrandt, because Richard Wormbrandt will steal us to joyfully walk into what we're about to walk into as a nation. And his body, like the brother we just listened to, bears, bore, he's in heaven now, the scars. Read his stuff. It will steal get you ready, and not with a fear, but he would be in prison and making music with the chains in prison, right? So rather than a third wayism that Keller talks about that's really a little bit cultural accommodation to not be bold, in my opinion, um, read guys that have been through it. Read dead guys. Richard Wormbrand's son was pretty much orphaned when he was in prison because his mom was in prison too. And here's this kid thrust into these public schools with the communist indoctrination and he's being ostracized, but he didn't fall away. And it reminds me of a story I read about a missionary family. I don't know the country, I'm sorry, I don't remember, but the locals drove them all up to the top of a cliff and said, you guys need to repent, stop following Christ, you know, recant all that or we're gonna start pushing you off the cliff one by one. And the dad is losing it because they're about to push his son off the cliff. And the son looks at his dad and says, don't you turn your back on Christ now. You taught me differently than that. You live it too. So I know the concerns like, what if I lose my job? What if I can't provide for my family? And Jesus said, no one who counts son or family more than me is worthy of following me. And these are hard words, but if we really believe that he is God and we really will stake our lives on it and say, kids, follow me as I follow Christ, it'll be worth it. Um, why you need to know what Wormbrandt too is um, Marxism is encroaching on the whole land and we think that's just political. Um, like this brother just shared, he got frustrated in Iraq um, from someone sharing about the Bible who knew the Quran and the Bible. The men of Issachar, Issachar knew the times and, and knew what to do. Uh, we need to know the ideologies and worldviews of what we're up against, not to win a political battle, but to evangelize lost souls bound by ideologies that will lead them to hell and, and read those kinds of men. Yeah, and I'll remind all of us that you never know how you're going to respond in that circumstance if you find yourself in that circumstance. So to remember your weakness, to cry out to the Lord, and to claim that promise that he said, words will be given to you. And so just dependence, because it's easy as believers to role play what we would do in those circumstances. And part of our training before we went overseas, we went through a kidnap scenario, and I totally blew it because they threw some variables at me that I never anticipated. And I went, the guy sat there and held me at gunpoint the whole time. And I'm the big, the reason he did that is because I'm six foot six and he was most scared of me. And I didn't plan on being held at gunpoint with a gun at my head while everybody else who was in captivity, they, they didn't supervise as much. So you never know how you're gonna respond. So, and just remember, the words will be given to you. Taylor, do we have any questions? I have a question, Taylor. What is Bitcoin? <laughs> <laughs> so, 
So we hear about, uh, you know, all these scary things that are going on and whatnot, but really, in all reality, um, to bring it to more of a positive point, what is the greatest joys that you have in your ministry? What are the things that bring you to tears of joy that you absolutely are just, you know, grateful to God for and just, you know, you, you fall down on the floor and say, God, thank you so much for bringing that to me. Great question. That, that would be, I don't have to think about that one. It's um, anytime you see someone being conformed to Christ, it just, there's a joy. There's just nothing sweeter. And then when they die. And every time I see one of our saints die, worshiping Jesus, believing, trusting, it, it's just the sweetest feeling you could ever have that all these people teaching, praying, exhorting, fellowshipping for all those years strengthen their faith as a means of grace to enter into his presence, trusting and believing. I'll just say, I just want to share a personal testimony to that, too. Um, watching that very thing and seeing that through a testimony of a, a dear brother here, I already introduced him, Jislan. Um, his testimony is radical, and I've gotten to, to just witness, um, let me just say it this way, when he was 22 or, or somewhere there about, moved to Tijuana with real, really no plan or purpose or vision, and I hope you're okay with me sharing this, brother. Um, and God radically saved him and brought him into a church that he would say with his own words was just, just kind of a, a soft on gospel kind of church. Um, but he started to grow. And when we moved to Tijuana, um, we met him uh, in the midst of where he was just growing like crazy. And we just witnessed here before the conference started, we were all praying in this back room and I just listened to a brother just exalt Christ in his prayer, and it was precious. And that, to me, is, is one of the sweetest things you can witness in ministry, is that very thing. That's the joy, seeing someone conform to Christ and declare those, those things. Uh, it's precious. Fresh understandings of the grace of God to me personally. I have seven kids, and... They make me lose my Christianity from time to time. <laughs> Regularly. I'm serious. And um, if you haven't read the book Gentle and Lowly by Dane Orland, read it. I'm like it on my third time because I need that book every day. Um, just because it's beautiful. Um, so I, I get teary-eyed about God's grace to me in spite of my gracelessness to my family. Um, and when I baptize believers... Holy cow. There is, Alistair Begg said something about the pastorate. It, it is a gracious privilege to be this far away from a couple making vows that will last a lifetime. It is a gracious privilege to hold the hand and pray for a saint that has minutes or hours to go into eternity. And it is a gracious privilege to stand in the waters of baptism and hear the transforming power of the gospel minutes before you immerse them in an ordinance that demonstrates dead with Christ, alive with Christ. There is nothing like that on the planet. Um, I keep thinking of a psalm that I've been praying for my parents, and that is that uh, they who go out carrying seed to sow, sowing with tears, will come in carrying sheaves, singing songs of joy. And there can be tears, there can be hard times in ministry and sharing the gospel, in walking the walk, in everyday life, being a parent and watching your kid, you know, rebel or strive against God or kick against the goads or whatever is the pain, whatever is causing the tears while you're trying to be faithful. And I tell you, there are going to be songs of joy when you come in carrying the sheaves and say, it was all worth it. 
look at this fruit to the glory of God. And, um, you know, my celebration is, oh, it just feels so great when I get to look someone in the eye and share the gospel with them. And there's just this, this life occurring right in front of your eyes. And I've delivered babies, and that's cool and all, but this is better. <laughs> Amen. Good comment. Any other questions? less of a question than an answer to the last question about um, living in the, the culture that we live in, those sorts of things. And I just found that it was really helpful that when we lived in Peru, it was a completely foreign culture. They didn't have American politics. They didn't worry about the same stuff that we worried about. Mm -hmm. And reading Facebook in those times was kind of a burden because I didn't want to engage in all that. I could be free from it as well. Um, but when you're in a foreign culture, it really helps you realize the citizenship in heaven that you have is primary. Mm -hmm. And we were close brothers and sisters with many other believers from many other lands in that foreign country. We we're all foreigners there. Mm -hmm. But we just rejoice to be part of that kingdom of heaven there and not worry about our, our own land actually seemed kind of distant to us when we returned. So I think everybody should get that experience for a year. <laughs> and it will help you in your Christian faith every year thereafter. Any more questions? Okay. Well, thank you for. Oh. Go ahead. I just wanted to um, ask if people in this church, like Pastor Ken and Daylene and just go for a walk and my husband took me and I had to wear a mask even doing that and I cheated and took that mask off but the people in this church they it came to mind Daniel is texting me every day with funny stuff and Pastor Ken texted me call me back when you need me and I told him I said That's, that's better than a question. Joy in ministry. The way that the body loved you through COVID. I did the same thing, Gail. I'm sorry. And 
this might be a long answer from all of you guys. But so how, as far as mission goes, because my perspective on sharing the gospels have changed dramatically over the last year. And so going from, I must share the gospel with every single person I encounter. Literally, I do not waste any time to, oh, God is sovereign. And there's those that have been predestined. But anyway, so how do, what approach should we take in the professional like world um, that understanding that God is sovereign, but then respecting my area of professionalism, but still being sensitive to the spirit, looking for the right time to um, proclaim the gospel? I'm going to give that to your pastor since he tied you in that knot. <clears throat> I'm gonna, no, that's an excellent question. And I think anytime you hear the doctrine of election and now to bring that all together is really, really important. So we're gonna start with Nick and, and then I know Ryan's gonna have some good stuff for us. And he gets to hear a lot from me. So I'm, I'm anxious for you guys to get to talk, um, answer this question. Um, and and Jesus, I know we've talked about this, but I, I just wanna say that um, the sovereignty of God is such a beautiful doctrine, um, and it's a comfort, right? It's a, it's a comfort for us to know that God is in control, and he is faithful. Um, the, the text that, that Paul already uh, mentioned, Philippians 1.6, um, we can be confident of this very thing, that he who begins a good work will finish it. I mean, those are great promises that deal with the sovereignty of God. Um, God is the one who ultimately regenerates us and draws us and, and changes us, conforms us, transforms us to his image. Um, but within that, we have to recognize that God also uses means. And that's Romans 10, you know, that, that people hear the gospel and they are saved. And so um, how can they hear but by a preacher? Uh, faith comes from hearing and hearing from the word of Christ. And so uh, we want to be faithful instruments in God's hands um, whereby the gospel goes out and, and reaches individuals. Um, but we can do so out of a place of rest in the sovereignty of God. And so there's certainly a tension there. And I don't think we'll ever really solve like where that, you know, where that line is. But, but we want to be careful not to fall on either side, which you already alluded to. I think that's important. I'd love to hear from these guys. I think when I was young... It was easy for evangelism to become a work. The sovereignty of God puts you to rest about evangelism so that people don't feel like you're selling them Amway. <laughs> Seriously, they want to know. I have a neighbor across the street. I've shared the gospel with him multiple times. They want to know you really love them and you're not trying to sell them something. And so if there's an urgency, that's, there can be an urgency of the flesh in evangelism that leads to then a guilt every time you don't share the gospel. And then you're just doing what he preached on. I loved it in his sermon. It's becoming a work. So just resting and loving people. And when God opens a door through which you drive a gospel truck, you'll know the moment because it'll be so clear that this is the moment. And, and they're saying things that are almost like the softball that you can just crush, right, in a good way and loving way. So just rest. Don't strive. You'll make it a work unto itself. God loves people. Love sinners. They'll sense that rather than you just trying to force the gospel down your throat to make you feel better that you didn't lack faithfulness when really that can be of the flesh. And if the Spirit is saying, now, share, You'll know that too. It's walking with the Lord. It's dynamic, not static. Hope that helps. Did that help, Aslan? <laughs> <laughs> That's how I'm gonna remember your name, so I might as well just get it out there. <laughs> no, did, did that did that kind of clear it up or do you want do you want us to keep shooting at it? Okay. 
Uh, I, one of my favorite quotes was, uh, I can't remember what preacher it was, but he says, I, you know, I preach like a Calvinist and I beg like an Arminian. Mm. And so I, I, I bring this truth and I plead and I, I beg as if, you know, it's, it's up to my beggings, even though I know it's God who draws. And so just that freedom. And, and I'd love to talk with you more. It's one of my favorite subjects, you know, before you leave if you want to talk more. Did you want to? One, one other thing just came to mind. I really appreciate that. Recognizing that um, predestination, election, those are, you know, buzzwords we love to use and they're beautiful truths. But those are not the gospel. And, and I know you know that too, brother, that the, the gospel is the good news of Jesus Christ. It's, it, it's primarily news. And so not getting hung up in all of that um, can really help set us free, too, in how we reach people. Um, sometimes we go at it like we got to have all the answers figured out. we got to talk people through the whole, the whole you know, spectrum of theological practice and those things. And, and so I just think be free, preach Christ, and you are doing that faithfully, man. So um, praise, praise God. I'm getting old, so I keep watching the people my age are walking out. Yeah. Yep, that's what I was just going to say something about that. Okay. Okay. So um, thank you for staying with us for the extra time for the Q&A. Very beneficial. Thank you, guys. I was really blessed. Thank you. Um, I want to invite you back tomorrow morning, 9 o'clock, is when we'll be starting. And we have uh, Ryan. And Brendan couldn't join us tonight because of a family emergency, so. Yeah, would you talk about who's going yeah, to take so, his place? Um, so since Brendan couldn't be here, be praying for his family, um, we have asked our own Rick Callahan to come bring the word of God uh, from Acts 2. So it, it's, it's going to be excellent, the, the mission from the church local. And so I encourage you to come back for that. Great. So let's go ahead and uh, close in prayer. Father, we rejoice in the work that you have done here tonight. Thank you for answering our prayers and being personally present through the power of your Holy Spirit. Lord, I pray for safety and travel for all of us as we return to our homes and a good night's rest. And may you call all of those people that you have appointed to be here tomorrow to be a part of the conference. Lord, bless us as we continue to seek after you for knowing more of you. I want to know him and the fellowship of his sufferings. That's what it means to know Christ. Lord, and we just pray that you would reveal yourself through the power and strength of your glory. And that, especially as we worship, thank you so much for the worship tonight. It was an excellent way to just reflect on the truths that we've been hearing and just praise you and look forward to what our eternal future in heaven is going to be. So we just ask your continued blessing upon this conference as we give thanks to you and glorify your name, Lord Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen.